Joy Alfred Brand, I am excited to talk about part three of the PPP discussion and what you've learned over that we've been going for several weeks now, and this is the third part we agreed to do because it's been changing so fast. Right. And uh, just before I get started, I'll give my little disclaimer. Um, yep. Not intended to give legal advice. This is just intended to give general information for folks who just need to be pointed in the right direction about their Paycheck Protection Program loans. And Martin, as you know, tomorrow is the last day you can apply for a Paycheck Protection Program loan. As we are recording this, today's June 29th. The uh, most recent legislation doesn't change that date. So tomorrow the actual loan program shuts down. But the Paycheck Protection Program Flexibility Act that was passed a couple of weeks ago, there there's a lot of stuff in there that the um, Department of Treasury and the Small Business Administration have produced guidelines on because it was actually quite small in terms of the size of the legislation. And so everyone kind of knew that the guidance that would come out, uh, sh you know, shortly thereafter would talk about the specifics. And so I've highlighted a couple of very important points that people are going to want to know about in order to get forgiveness for the most part. So, um, the first thing is, I think we may have covered this a little bit, but I'll just go over it just to, as a refresher. First of all, the program, uh, Paycheck Protection Program Flexibility Act has expanded the covered period from eight to 24 weeks. Now, this is for any loans that were taken out as of June 5th, but those loans that came before June 5th, they can choose to elect the extended, or they can choose to elect the eight-week peri eight period rather than the extended 24-week period. Um, the second point is, of course, it lowers the amount of money you need to spend on payroll costs to, in order to get forgiveness from 75% to 60%. And then it also expands the maturity period from 24 months or two years to five years. So if you actually do have a Paycheck Protection Program loan that does, you're gonna to have to pay back as a loan, you'll have five years to do it instead of the two. Now, this legislation also allows for early loan forgiveness applications. Um, I, I would be very cautious about that though, because if you apply early for loan forgiveness, then you can forfeit your safe harbor for provision, allowing uh, borrowers to restore salaries or wages by December 31st. So it can be costly if you decide to apply for forgiveness early. So that's something to be aware of. Um, and the other, so a couple of other little small things in there. Um, it's the borrower's responsibility to provide accurate calculation of the loan forgiveness amount. We've already kind of talked about that a little bit, but this is something that's coming up in the the information, my research, uh, you need to make sure that you're being careful about that calculation. Um, also, the interim final rule reinforces the rule that the Small Business Administration will deduct any economic injury disaster loan advance amounts, so that $10,000 or however much it was that you re may have received if you have applied for a paycheck for protection um, you need, you're going to need to know that that $10,000 or whatever those advance amounts were for you as a borrower, that's going to be deducted from your forgiveness amount. So that's something to be aware of too. I've had some people question me about that. Well, I, ha I, I haven't heard that and that's not my understanding, but yes, this fin interim final rule does reinforce that, you know, that, re that, um, reduction. So a couple more things real quick. Um, let's talk about the deferral period for Paycheck Protection Program loans. So when I say deferral period, what I'm talking about is how long do you have after the covered period before you have to start making your interest in loan payments, right? So if your Paycheck Protection Program loan was made before June 5th, um, you, of course, could ask your lender to have your covered period extended to that June 24th length of time, covered period, right? If not, then, you know, once your period is up under the original rule, you would have had six months. Under this rule, you're going to have 10 months to apply for forgiveness. 
um, if you submit to your lender a loan forgiveness application within 10 months after the end of your loan forgiveness covered period, you won't have to make any payments of principal or interest on your loan before the date on which the SBA remits to your lender the loan forgiveness amount. So that's how it works. When you are ready to apply for forgiveness, what happens is you submit your forgiveness application to your lender, they you know, go through it and then submit it to the SBA and then the SBA has to get back to the lender and say, yes, we're gonna pay off that loan that you've given to the borrower. Mm -hmm. um, and if you wait too long, if you go past that 10 month period, then uh, you, you're gonna have to pay, you know, begin paying principal and interest whether or not you would have qualified for forgiveness. So that's something that's very important to, to know. You need to hit that window and make sure that you're applying in a timely manner because otherwise you, you know, you're gonna have issues with, you're gonna go forward and have to pay principal and interest, okay? Also, let's talk just for a second about forgiveness. There was a question when this pay, Paycheck Protection Program Flexibility Act came out, whether or not that 60% um, requirement of paying payroll costs was a cliff or just a hill, you know, was it scalable? Mm -hmm. So uh, they, were, they were saying, for example, um, if I don't spend all the 60% of my funds on payroll costs, does that mean I don't get any forgiveness at all? And the answer to that is, is no you can still get some forgiveness uh, you the because there's it if there was if it was a cliff right if you if you didn't if you didn't spend your 60% correctly and that cut off your access to forgiveness that would clash with the safe harbor rule allowing you to adjust for you know lost employees and covid-19 and things like that but um, borrower is still eligible for partial forgiveness, even if they don't spend at least 60% on payroll. So it's going to be a scale, right? So your forgiveness amount will be adjusted based on how you spent that money. And that's something you're going to want to go through your forgiveness amount calculation in order to make sure you're maximizing the full amount of forgiveness that you can get. But it may be a, it may be a percentage based on how you have spent those funds. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about is there are now two types of applications that you can use to apply for forgiveness. Uh, they have made the original application a little bit more user friendly. So the borrower can then, you know, have an easier time of filling it out and submitting it. Um, they're just trying to make it a little bit more efficient but they also created a second application for uh, people who are self-employed and have no employees or did not reduce the salaries or wages of their employees by more than 25% and did not reduce the number or hours of their employees or experienced reductions in business activity as a result of health directives related to COVID-19 and did not reduce the salaries or wages of their employees by more than 25%. I'm reading because this is all still pretty new, so I don't have it uh, committed to memory, but they are calling that second application the easy version of the forgiveness application. So that's something that's very important for micro businesses or people, you know, uh, people who have uh, no employees at all, which micro business, <laughs> or people who, you know, have um, minimal reduction in employees or the amount of hours they've worked, et cetera, and then it's based on COVID-19. So there are ways that folks who are not, um, you know, 400 employees or whatever, that they can easily get access to that application and fill it out in a more efficient way so they don't have any issues, which I think folks would have had initially with the more burdensome onerous application where you've had you know you've got a whole lot more information that you've got to put in there but it's still on the borrower to make sure that they're you know giving correct app, uh, information on the application does that mm -hmm. so hope that makes sense <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of information to kind of synthesize and put together pretty quickly so so if someone were going to apply <laughs> Really, probably by the time they see this video, the time has passed is the important piece. Is, is applying of the 30th or what? To, to apply for the loan itself, right. yes. 
<laughs> applying for forgiveness is something entirely different. But right. for someone to apply for the loan, yes, by the time they see this video, the program more than likely will have shut down. Right. The next thing is how do you manage the money that you've applied for? Right. <clears throat> and understanding that that's shifted. And, and these are the important things for them to consider. Well, it's only shifted slightly in terms of managing your money. So okay. the shift has just gone down in terms of the percentage you have to spend on payroll costs right. in order to qualify for forgiveness. So it's gone down from 75 to 60%. So that's a, that's a little bit better. That gives folks a little bit more wiggle room with the 40% and what they're going to, and I, and I, my understanding is inherently that what you spend the money on has not changed just mm -hmm. how much, gotcha. but it still gives you a little bit more wiggle room um, to make sure that you're fitting into those guidelines. And then the advice we have is get someone who's certified in this and run it by them. But this is to understand they made it a little softer for you. And it's also the forgiveness is not, like you said, it's a, it seems to be more of a hill than a cliff, you know, you well, get it or not. Right. And so, under the original legislation, it was still a sliding scale of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So uh, your forgiveness amount was based on, you know, how closely you fit the, the, that 75-25 ratio. And it's still going to be the, pretty similar. They've just changed the amounts. And again, I do agree with you. It is important for folks who are borrowers to get an accountant or an accounting professional who, or a payroll professional, uh, of course, we talked about this before in the first video, but the idea is to get someone who has a fiduciary responsibility to make sure they're advising you carefully. So mm -hmm. someone who's an agent who can mm -hmm. advise you about your calculations and make sure that those numbers are, are as close to being accurate as possible. Um, but again, that is that liability falls squarely on the lent, on the borrower if they haven't gotten advice from a, you know, a third party agent. Mm -hmm. That's, that's excellent. Now it's the managing the loan. You know, we've got the applying right. for the loan. If you got it, you got it. And now understand it's important that you manage this properly. You get in contact with the support team you have. And right. I, I'm a huge advocate that, you know, if you don't, if you somehow got it, you don't have an advisor, talk to your chamber or somebody you trust yes. in your network to find someone Especially recommended especially your chambers. Um, yeah. The chambers of commerce are, come, are emerging as uh, knowledge bases for small businesses who are trying to find assistance to help with uh, forgiveness applications and calculation of the amounts that needs to go on the forgi forgiveness applications to maximize forgiveness. So really your chamber of commerce is, a, is an excellent resource, resource for you. Um, but, you know, I do think, I see... You know, I see where the big issue is going to come in is in the coming months when people are trying to just sort through this hill of information to make sure that their forgiveness applications are timely and mm -hmm. correctly filled out. So that's why it's ever so important to make sure that you're getting advice from a good agent. And typically an accountant is going to be a CPA, a tax professional is going to be your best course of action to make sure that your forgiveness application is accurate. And you, we've talked about that before, how to, how, to, um, how to find folks who are agents and anyone who has, you know, wants to go through that again, they can check out the other two videos that we've done. But um, this is something that I, I just can't stress enough how important it is to make sure you're getting good advice and getting good information mm -hmm. because you could wind up holding the bag on a pretty substantial loan payment for five years now. And I haven't seen that the interest rate on it has changed. Uh, I think the interest rate is still going to be the same, but you don't want to create more of an issue for yourself ha having an unexpected loan payment, you know, as you're coming out of this pandemic and already being financially insecure as small businesses. So that could be just, you know, that could just really be disastrous for a lot of small businesses out there. Outstanding. This is really helpful. And we'll have some resources below. So click on that. And Joy, tell them a little bit more about other stuff you've got. You've got a lot of uh, affordable and free information that helps both individuals 
and being able to be more in control of their money, uh, keep more, make more, you know, everything and right. how they can learn more about that. Well, the most important thing I would talk about right now is first of all, you can find me on a bunch of different platforms. Hopefully um, Martin will. Yeah. We'll put, put them in the links. Yeah. But I just recently finished and, and it went live last week. Uh, my financial first aid kit, which mm -hmm. is completely free. And it's a 46 minute video and uh, I think five documents that you can download to help you negotiate with your creditors or uh, figure out just where to get started in if you're in a financial tailspin. So that has been a real labor of love for me to put together for people. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I'm not charging anything for it, mm -hmm. even though it is a very good resource. Uh, I've had a couple people look at it and tell me they've, you know, found it very useful and helpful. So I want to push that out there so folks can find it. Otherwise, I have written two books. Yay! Which is, <laughs> which uh, is, you can find both of these books on my website. One of them is Money Basics, Keeping and Growing It. And the other one is My Parents' Guide to Better Borrowing because student loan debt is another big issue for me. If you can't tell, my, my main mission is, in life is to help 99 percenters Mm. just get financially stable and mm. be financially empowered. Right. So that's my number one mission. And you can find all that information at newcashreview.com. Outstanding. This was great. I appreciate it. This, this completes our multi-part program over this journey. And I look forward to coming up with some other things we'll do. So if you see anything else you think will help small business, we'll get a, we'll get another show for people because I know Absolutely. people appreciate it. it. And it's always a pleasure chatting with you, Martin, and uh, working with you. So I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you so much for having Sounds me. Sounds great. Thanks.